Turn with me, please, to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis 1. As we continue in our series entitled, How Did We Get Here? And we mean that in two ways. How did we get here physically? How are we here on this earth? And then how do we get here spiritually in this state of needing redemption? How do we get in that situation as the human race? Last week, we looked at just Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And someone told me I preached too short. Let the record show <laughs> that I was given that piece of feedback because it will never happen again. No, just kidding. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> so uh, I want to approach chapters one and part of chapter two in a little bit different way because I think there are really two tellings of the same story of creation in these. The one that we're really familiar with in chapter one where, where Moses, as he's writing this, walks through the seven days, six days of creation, one day of rest. And then there's kind of a short retelling of it in chapter two, but with a, a different focus. There's so much in those two chapters, I don't want to rush through some of these very important doctrines. So what I'm going to do this week is look at chapter 1, 1 through 2, 14. It's a little bit of, of a longer section that I'm going to read. And then I'll go back next week and focus in on the parts that are specifically about God's creation of mankind. Because there's just so many important doctrines there, especially the doctrine of the image of God that brings dignity to every human person, that sets us apart from the rest of creation. So I don't want to rush through that. Uh, so we'll t focus next week on the, chap the parts of both chapters that talk about the creation of mankind. So let's read 1-1, one, a one, little bit of an extended section, but I want to get the entire creation account in one, one sweep here. So 1-1 one, one through 2-14. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. There was an evening, and there was a morning, one day. Then God said, let there be an expanse between the waters, separating water from water. So God made the expanse and separated the water under the expanse from the water above the expanse, and it was so. God called the expanse sky. Evening came, and then morning, the second day. Then God said, let the water under the sky be gathered into one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. God called the dry land earth, and the gathering of the water he called seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth produce vegetation, seed-bearing plants, and fruit trees on the earth, bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And it was so. The earth produced vegetation, seed-bearing plants according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Evening came, and then morning, the third day. Then God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. They will serve as signs for seasons and for days and for years. They will be lights in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth. And it was so. God made the two great lights, the greater light to rule over the day and the lesser light to rule over the night as well as the stars. God placed them in the expanse of the sky to provide light on the earth, to rule the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. Evening came and then morning, the fourth day. Then God said, let the waters swarm with living creatures and let birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the large sea creatures and every living creature that moves and swarms in the water according to their kinds. He also created every winged creature according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters of the seas, and let the birds multiply on the earth. Evening came, and then morning, the fifth day. And God said, let the earth produce living creatures according to their kinds, livestock, creatures that crawl, and the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. So God made the wildlife of the earth according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that crawl on the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They will rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, and the creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them male and female. 
God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, and subdue it. Rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and every creature that crawls on the earth. God also said, Look, I have given you every seed-bearing plant on the surface of the entire earth, and every tree whose fruit contains seed. This will be food for you, for all the wildlife of the earth, for every bird of the sky, and for every creature that crawls on the earth, everything having the breath of life in it. I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. Evening came, and then morning, the sixth day. So the heavens and the earth and everything in them were completed. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. These are the records, before I say that, notice that it sort of kind of backs up and starts over, I think, at verse 4. I think he looks at it from a different perspective. These are the records of the heavens and the earth concerning their creation. At the time that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, no shrub of the field had yet grown in the land, and no plant of the field had yet sprouted. For the Lord God had not made it rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. But mist would come up from the earth and water all the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man out of the dust from the ground and breathed the breath of life into his nostrils, and the man became a living being. The Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he placed the man he had formed. The Lord God caused to grow out of the ground every tree pleasing in appearance and good for food, including the tree of life in the middle of the garden, as well as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon, which flows through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. Gold from that land is pure. Bedellium and Onyx are also there. The name of the second river is Gihon, which flows through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third is Tigris, which runs east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. What an amazing God we have and an amazing world that he has given us. And the first thing that I want to say as we consider this whole sort of large section of Scripture, this account of creation, is is an overall clarification, a note before we move move ahead. And that's this. It is okay for believers to differ in their interpretation of this story. It's okay for us to have different views of how these days worked out. There's a range of orthodoxy here. Just like on many doctrines, many difficult-to-understand doctrines, there's a range of of where you can come down and still be a faithful Christian holding to and, and believing in the Bible. Moses, as he wrote this, was not seeking to give us a scientific textbook and answer every scientific question that we might have. Now, wherever the Bible speaks, it's true. We know that. But he wasn't seeking to answer every question that we might bring to this text about scientific things. That doesn't mean something is missing from Scripture. God's God's Word is sufficient. It provides everything that we need. It has no holes or missing pieces. We didn't need every scientific question answered to be saved and to live the Christian life. And with regard to to this period of time, to the the days of creation, there are two major positions among Bible-believing people today, and they're often referred to as young earth and old earth. There's another position that has fewer adherents among Bible-believing people, and I believe strongly that it is unbiblical and unorthodox, meaning it's not within uh, faithful Christian doctrine, although I think, I don't, I wouldn't call it heresy, because I think you can believe this and still be a Christian, but there's the other position is called theistic evolution, which means they believe that God used the process of evolution to create the world. But I don't think that understands creation or evolution properly. Because evolution, by definition, means it's unguided. That there's no one over the process. And creation clearly shows us, the Bible clearly shows us, that God was intimately involved in this process. So there are some who believe in theistic theistic evolution. I think it's outside Christian orthodoxy, although I think you still go to heaven if you believe that and you believe in Jesus. Okay? So let's go back to those two main positions. Old earth, young earth. Old earth, uh, creationists believe that Adam, Adam himself was created only a few thousand years ago, but it looks at science and looks at this text and says that the earth is, is possibly billions of years old. It sees a way for that to reconcile with Scripture and still believe in a literal Adam and Eve. Because I think that's one of the things that, that's one of the reasons theistic evolution falls apart, because how do you describe a literal Adam and Eve if they just kind of randomly evolved from other things? 
Scripture is very clear in this text and many other texts, especially the book of Romans, that Adam and Eve were literal people who, who made a decision to turn away from God and led us into sin. So old earthers believe in that. They just believe the earth itself is very old. Young earthers look at science. They don't, they're not ignoring science. They look at science and look at Scripture and they say that the earth, earth must be young, like thousands of years old or tens of thousands of years old possibly, uh, based on this and other passages. Now, I think some on both sides have gone too far and started labeling the other side wrongly. And you may not have any knowledge of this, but some of you, I think, are reading in this area. And I want you to understand, when, when someone who's a young earther calls an old earther an evolutionist, that's not very loving, and I think it's not true. And when someone who's an old earther looks at a young earther and says, well, you're undermining the cause of the gospel because you're ignoring science, that's not helpful either. This is an area where we should be loving and patient with each other and understand that there are biblical and scientific arguments that can be made for both sides. In fact, even one of the major theologians of the Protestant Reformation 500 years ago, he suggested that God spoke of the six days as a way of accommodating the story of creation in a way that we can understand it. This is not a new idea. You may have guessed this, but I'm not going to solve this problem today. <laughs> I'll tell you, I lean towards one of these positions, but I hold it really loosely. Biblical pointers to a young earth include things like the statement of an evening and a morning, and there was a day, right? Kind of sounds like a 24-hour day. Uh, it mentions that there's six days, and then the Sabbath. Sounds like a real week. But then old earthers come back and say, well, how is there a literal evening and morning if the sun isn't created until the fourth day? They're not saying Scripture is false. They're saying maybe we should interpret chapter 1 poetically or figuratively, especially given the different way that it's approached in chapter 2, where it looks like he says that, there's, that creation is done, but no plants have grown. And because there's no one to work the ground. And then he creates Adam, and then it looks like he makes the garden. So it, it's okay to see this from different perspectives and understand, like, for example, the Hebrew word for day in chapter 1, it can be translated many different ways. It's not always a 24-hour period. In fact, in verse 5, it's translated two different ways. God called the light day. He's not talking about 25 or 24 hour, 25 hours. It's an hour, hour. I just added an hour to the day. <laughs> God called the light day. He's not talking about 24 hours. And then at the end of the verse, there was a morning, one day, evening and a morning. So it, there's just a lot of different ways you can look at this. Perhaps the two chapters are organized along different lines. One, a progression through parts of creation, and another somewhat thematically through the focus on mankind. Much of Scripture's poetry. We interpret that differently. Maybe that's how we should treat this part of Genesis. That's actually the way that I lean with chapter 1. One clarification. The Bible is most assuredly not in conflict with science. I want you to hear that from me because as you watch the news or you interact with other worldviews in our culture, they will tell you, they will say that, well, if you believe the Bible, you're anti-science. I would argue that Christianity and belief in God harmonize with the world around us far better than a naturalistic and an evolutionary perspective. A simple look at the world around you, at things like photosynthesis, cellular re respiration, how those two processes feed into each other and provide us with what we need to breathe and stay alive and, and eat Photosynthesis, the precipitation cycle, the perfect placement of the earth and the solar system to sustain life, the slight tilt of the planet, 23 and a half degrees to provide our seasons, the food chain, the wonder of the human body. Look at these things and understand the incredibly obvious fact that they have been designed. They are not an accident. They are not the result of chaos. From a mathematical and probability standpoint, that idea alone is ridiculous. Many of the most influential scientists over the centuries have been believers in God, and many of them have been devout Christians. The scientific method itself grew out of a bedrock belief in the order and design God had put into the universe. And that because he had done that, there was a predictability of the universe that allowed and even encouraged scientific study. Science has been described as thinking God's thoughts after him, right, as we discover what he has put into the universe. The scientific method requires that a process be repeated to prove that a hypothesis is true. And macroevolution, you know, the, the evolutionary worldview, that has never once been repeated by scientists. 
ever. <laughs> if, if someone tells you that the Bible is anti-science, do not buy it. Christianity and the Bible fit with science far better than any competing worldview. And I'm confident, just finishing up this section, I'm confident that you can be faithful to Scripture and science while holding to either a young earth or an old earth view. Let's give room and freedom here for other believers who love Scripture and the Lord as much as we do. And let's enjoy deep study and robust conversation about God's Word. Well, let's do so in love, focusing on what is most important. So, having laid that groundwork, I want you to see three major truths that we learn from this glorious account of creation. Number one, the entire Trinity was deeply involved in creation. This was not just something that God the Father was doing. We think of it that way often, sort of by default, but Scripture makes clear that the, the entire Trinity was involved. Look at verse 2. Now the earth was formless and empty, darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. So it's not just the Father, here's the Holy Spirit. And notice how close he is. He's hovering right there over the surface of the waters. He's deeply involved. He's, he's intimately close to this work that God is doing. And it's not just the Father and the Spirit. Listen to John 1. This will be up on the screen. Verses 1 through 3. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word is a title for Jesus, or a title for the second person of the Trinity, the Son. As you'll see in a minute, I'll show you, I'll prove it to you from this same chapter. But the Word, Jesus, it, it, that's a kind of a confusing theological idea. But he, he's the embodiment of the word of God. That shows how, how powerful his word is. He was with God in the beginning. So he is God. He's a member of the Trinity. But he's also with God. So there's fellowship within the Trinity. All things, here it is, all things were created through him. And apart from him, not one thing was created that has been created. So we've had the Father, we've had the Spirit, and here's the Son. And I'll show you, verse 14 makes it clear who the word is. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So not a single thing was created apart from the Word, which is another name for the second person of the Trinity, the Son of God. The one who thousands of years after creation decided to put on the very flesh that he had created and took on the name Jesus of Nazareth. So creation was not a project of the Father that he was doing. And, and then when it got messed up by sin, he called the Son and, hey, I need you to come fix this. That's not what was happening. This was a Trinitarian idea, a Trinitarian project from the beginning. And of course, Jesus already knew what would happen. He knew that we'd fall into sin. He knew that he would come rescue us. Scripture says in Ephesians that he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. God knew this would happen. And he had planned to save you. He knew that he would come and redeem us. Well, grace and love. You can see this Trinitarian aspect one more time in verse 26. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Who's he talking to? <laughs> it's not the angels, because we're not made in the image of the angels. Right? Let us make man in our image. He's speaking to the other members of the Trinity. He's made us in his image, and it's the whole Trinity involved. How amazing that the one and only true God would be so intimately involved in making this world and making a glorious home for us. It was a Trinitarian project from the beginning, and it shows his glory and his holiness. But creation shows us more about God. Number two, God's power and authority were on display in creation. Listen to verse three. Then God said, let there be light. He says it, and there was light. The almighty power of his voice, his word, there it is. The word of God was involved in every part. Light was brand new at that point. God invented light, and God created it at this moment. And listen, we don't even fully understand light yet. The very first thing God created. And sometimes it acts like a particle. Sometimes it acts like a wave. Light speed, 186,000 miles a second. I can't really wrap my mind around that. Einstein, his theory of relativity, and most scientists think he was right about this, that time slows down as you approach the speed of light. Ever remember that movie from the 80s, The Flight of the Navigator? Right? That movie where the kid, he gets abducted by aliens. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? He gets abducted by aliens, and he's gone for eight years, and because he was traveling the speed of light, he comes back, everyone's aged, and he's the same age, and it's like freaks him out and everything. There's actually some scientific <laughs> truth to that. 
The speed of light is amazing. Light, the first thing God created, is an amazing thing that we haven't figured out yet. His power is on display right away in this account. And all he has to do is say it, and it's there. Verse 5, God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. Notice this, he's naming things. In Scripture, that is very important. You see authority through the power to name, through the right of naming. I mean, you see this in your own family. If you have a child, you get the right to name that child. In Scripture, we see that with children. We see that with God giving in Revelation. It says he'll give us a new name that no one else knows. Uh, people in, in Scripture, uh, if, they, if they win a battle, they can name the land or name the city that they win. God is showing his authority through the power of naming light into day and darkness into night. And we see that throughout this passage. I'm not going to reread all these verses, but the second day, he calls for an expanse between the waters, separating it. you got water above, above and below. And it looks like it's talking about you know, the, the oceans, but then an atmosphere. Some people think there could have been like a hydrosphere surrounding the earth. I don't know the answer to that. But God divides it up into sky and then waters above and below. The third day, he calls for dry land. He names it earth and calls the water seas. And the same day, he calls for plants, and he describes this is how they will reproduce. You see his authority, his plan, his design. The fourth day, he calls for sun, moon, stars, and causes them to rule day and night and to mark seasons and days and years. He has all power. The fifth day, he calls for birds and sea creatures, creating them. Think about this. He, he, as he does that, he's imbued them with this, this power of swimming and flight. So all the physics behind that. You ever look up at a huge jet in the sky and you're like, how in the world is that hanging up in the air? Like it's tons and tons, you know, hundreds of tons or whatever. This, this glorious idea that the, the way the air flows across that wing, it, it gets it to lift up in the air. God invented that at this moment. And he commands these animals to be fruitful and multiply. He gives them command. He has all authority. Verse 6, he calls, or not verse 6, the sixth day, he calls for land creatures. They show up when he says it. And then he gets to the crown of his creation, mankind, which we'll talk about more next week. And on the seventh day, Genesis 2, 3 says, he blessed the seventh day and he declared it holy, showing his authority over the week and over our use of time, calling for us to rest. The Lord has all authority and power. And scripture makes this clear in creation in the very first pages of God's word. And lastly, in many ways, many ways we see God's goodness in creation. His goodness is seen throughout. And you can think of God's creation like an artist's canvas that demonstrates something about him. You know that picture, of Sal that, picture that Salvador Dali painted with the clock kind of melting off the table? And it's surrealism. It's this strange thing. That guy had a strange worldview. Right? It, it comes through in his art. Uh, Michelangelo laying on his back for four years painting the Sistine Chapel. I'm sure he dropped a lot of paint in his eye. That's what I always think about. Okay? <laughs> But the commitment, you see the passion, the commitment, this guy, that character in, inside him comes out through his art. You are God's canvas. This creation is God's canvas. It shows his goodness in lots of different ways. Last week we clarified, God did not need to create. He wasn't lonely. There was no emptiness in him or lack in God that was filled by creating he did so out of an overflow of his own lavish kindness and grace and goodness, especially goodness you see it in this text. There's a refrain that shows up six times in chapter one. God looks around, he evaluates his creation, his evaluation we know is true, and he says, it is good, six times. And then as the chapter finishes, that refrain repeats but changes a little bit. Chapter one, verse 31 God saw all that he had made, and it was very good indeed. That's his summary statement of the whole thing. It was very good. And it was very good because he is very good. Creation exists to show his glory, his holiness, and his beauty, and his goodness. And I want to show you examples of this. First, we see his goodness through creation's order. That's letter A under this, under this heading. He shows his goodness through creation's order. Look at verse 2 where it says that the, the, that the earth was empty and formless and void. Right? Some people think that maybe that was God getting the raw materials ready that he would make creation out of. But however he did it, he took something and made it that was not ordered and made it order for creation. 
He brought order to things. There's a predictability. There's, there's a uh, design in creation. He divides things into light and dark, day and night. He uses sun and moon for days and years and seasons. So there's a natural order as we orbit the sun, our movement through space. Then there's land and seas. And then there's plants made according to their kinds. They reproduce according to their own seeds. You know, some of you have seen on Facebook, I keep finding these amazing flowers in our yard from the previous owner. I did not plant them or tend them, and they're just bursting with all these incredible blooms. Azaleas, roses, and others. Why are those there? Because those are the seeds that the previous owner planted. And next year, if I don't do something dumb and kill them, <laughs> they'll show up again. It's not going to be tulips and hydrangeas, right? It's going to be the same thing. They, they, they reproduce, these plants reproduce and continue to bloom according to their kinds. They're predictable. There's order to it. And that's even more important when you think about us being able to plant crops for people to eat. It's important that as a farmer plants a certain crop that he can expect that that's what will come up and we can be fed by it. So we have order. Next, we have beauty. Letter B. It says the sun, the moon, and the stars. Ken mentioned as we started our service, just the sunrise, the beauty of God's creation, a full moon, the stars above, the constellations. God put all that there. The oceans are mentioned here. Plants, like I mentioned flowers a second ago. Animals, I think of the birds just on the, on the third day. The cardinals, blue jays, eagles, the beautiful tropical birds that we see. Some of you are starting to have hummingbirds show up in your yard. I mean, the intricacy of that, the beauty of it. In chapter 2, verse 9, it says there are trees that are pleasing in appearance. He doesn't just throw them out there, hey, here's some fruit to eat. No, he makes them beautiful and pleasing in appearance. Chapter 2, verse 11, talks about gold in the land. Many of us are wearing this, right? It's, it's a beautiful thing, a gift from God. Let her see God's been good to us through variety. He doesn't make everything the same. There's day and then there's night. There's land and there's sea. The contrast of those makes our experience richer. The seasons that we experience. This year in Memphis, we've seen a lot more variety there. Especially for me, coming from Florida. <laughs> what is this white stuff, right? Creatures around, around the planet. He has creatures in the, on land and in the sea and in the air. There's many kinds of fruit trees. It seems like the garden had many different types. And today, we have so many types of food and colors and smells and flavors and textures. It's rich in variety. God has been good to us in that. Life is not boring or monochromatic. It's rich and varied and beautiful. And his good creation is not only beautiful, it is functional. Letter D, God is good to us through his provision. His provision. One of my main jobs as a father for our family is to provide a place, a home that's safe for our family. And then to provide nourishment for them, right? To provide food to take care of them. Well, God is the ultimate father. And in creating here, he has provided a home for all of his creatures. A place for us. And he's provided nourishment for us. We see he, he provides land, a place to stand, a place to plant crops and have jobs and build homes. He provides food through the seed-bearing plants and fruit. In chapter 2, verse 6, it says that there was a mist that came up from the ground to water the plants. And of course, now we have rain. Chapter 1, verse 17, he's provided light through the sun and the moon. Think about his provision just of light. That we have, we have vision. We can see where we're going. We have guidance. And light signifies hope and, and safety for us. Chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, listen to this. On the seventh day, God had completed his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy, for on it he rested from all his work of creation. God was not tired. <laughs> he never gets tired. He has no lack of energy or power. This was a gift to us. A gift uh, of, of the example of resting. And then later, we know in Scripture, for the Jews, he would set up a command to have a Sabbath rest. He provides for them to rest. Uh, during uh, during uh, the the French Revolution, there was a time period where the French were trying so hard to throw off all authority that they said, we're not going to have a seven-day week anymore. We don't want to do things God's way. And uh, uh, they had a 10-day week. They said, well, you can have a, a, 
longer work week. You still get a day off, but it's after 10 days. Until it really started having a really bad effect on man and beast alike. Just that three-day difference was hard on them. It was too much for their bodies. And you know what? They went back. <laughs> You're like, God, God knows what he's doing. God gave us the gift of rest, the provision of that. And he did so not because he needed rest, but because he wanted to set an example and guide us in that. Last thing, the last way God shows, or I'm sure you could come up with many more, but these are the five that I came up with. <laughs> uh, the last thing that we see God's goodness through in creation is blessing. We see it the first time in chapter 1, verse 22. I thought this was interesting. The first time he blesses, it's directed at animals. God, he, after he creates the, the animals in the air and, and the water, God bless them. Be fruitful, multiply, and fill the waters of the seas and let the birds multiply on the earth. In chapter 1, verse 28, after he creates man, he blesses them. We'll talk about that more next week. And then chapter 2, verse 3, God blessed the seventh day and declared it holy. And through that, he's blessing us, as I said, through the gift of rest. The canvas of creation demonstrates the goodness of the creator, the supreme artist. He has been kind. All three members of the Trinity have been intimately involved in making you and making this universe, demonstrating the power and authority and beauty and love and goodness of our God. He is worthy of your lives. He is worthy of your worship. He is your maker. He is worthy of your trust. Listen to Psalm 100. I want to close on this first before we transition into the Lord's Supper or this chapter. This is from the New American Standard Version. And it's a meditation on God's character and his goodness in creating us. A psalm for thanksgiving. Shout joyfully to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful singing. Know that the Lord himself is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. For the Lord is good. His loving kindness is everlasting and his faithfulness to all generations. 